Happy Thursday, everyone. We want to thank CHCI for hosting us today. On behalf of the CHCI Alumni Association, DC Metro Chapter, the Hispanic Bar Association of DC, and Latino Just Justice, we thank you so much for spending your evening with us. And welcome to our annual webinar series, Becoming a Lawyer. We'll be hearing from Latinx professionals in the legal field, whether it's public interest, academia, or corporate. And you'll hear a transparent conversation about how to apply to law school, the ins and outs, and what different avenues there are from there. The conversation will be moderated by Maritza Perez, CHCI alum, alumna from the 2009 internship program, and currently the Director of National Affairs for the Drug Policy Alliance. Maritza, handing it over to you. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, JD. I'm very excited about tonight's program. Uh, we first put on this program actually in 2020. I like to think about it as a little warm up for what I would hope would be an annual tradition. So we're gonna try to make this regular programming for you all because we think there needs to be more Latino lawyers. Um, Latinos are about 18% of the US population, but only about 5% of all US barred attorneys. And we know that representation matters, not least of all in the legal profession. So as Judy said, my name is Maritza Perez. I'm with the Drug Policy Alliance, but I'm also wearing my Hispanic Bar Association of DC hat today. I'm the president for the year, um, and the HBDC is an organization that really empowers Latino lawyers in the DMV area, and also provides legal services and advocacy on behalf of the DMV Latino community. Um, I'm really excited about today's program. Um, just to give you guys a, sh a short run of show, we're gonna start by introducing our panelists. All of them represent different legal fields. And then after that, like after a conversation with them, we'll jump to audience questions. Um, we really wanna make sure that you guys get an opportunity to ask our panelists any questions you might have. I know for me, when I was applying to law school, I had so many questions, so I'm sure you all do too. Um, so with that, I'm going to invite our panelists to join me on stage. I'm gonna ask everyone to introduce themselves and I'll kick it off by modeling um, the introduction. So if you could please start with your name, um, let me know where you currently work, explain your legal career trajectory, and then any information you wanna share about your background, um, including um, Hispanic nationality. So I'm Maritza Perez. Again, I'm the director of the Office of National Affairs for the Drug Policy Alliance. It's a nonprofit that works to end the war on drugs. Um, I'm based in DC. I've always been based in DC since leaving law school. My dream was always to be an advocate on the Hill and I'm very thankful to be doing that work now. I started at MALDEF, the Mexican American Legal Defense and Educational Fund, where I was a legislative staff attorney focused on criminal justice reform as well as other civil rights issues. And then I moved to the Center for American Progress, a progressive think tank, where I was a senior policy analyst for criminal justice reform issues. And now I use my law degree in a similar but different role as the director of this federal office that advocates on behalf of people who use drugs and advocates for criminal system legal reform. Um, I'm a first generation everything, first generation immigrant, first generation American, I should say, um, first generation professional, certainly the first to go to college and go to law school, and I am Mexican American. Um, so with that, I will kick it to Julie. Well, it's very nice to meet you all. Um, my name is Julie Condi. I work for the US uh, Government Accountability Office. I am a senior staff attorney with the Office of General Counsel. Um, I am, as Maritza said, also first generation. Actually, I am an immigrant, so maybe my children will be first generation. I think that's the way it works. I came here when I was about 10 years old. I am the first in my family to go to college and also the first in my family to be a lawyer. Um, I, my, career, my career trajectory, I would say, was a little bit different because I left law, I left college, and then I went to, I, I knew that Law school was going to be really expensive, so I decided, you you know what, I'm going to give this a try, um, and went and worked for a law firm, then went to law school, and then somehow ended here. Um, I do a lot of different work um, because uh, the Government Accountability Office audits executive agencies, and the agency that I audit is the Department of Defense. I do a little bit of everything, so my work is pretty wide. I'm a regulatory attorney. Um, and I'm really grateful to be here. I'm also wearing my hat of um, secretary for the HBA DC, as well as HNBA's compliance and ethics uh, chair. So thank you so much for having me. 
Thanks, Julie. Um, and I'll kick it to Emmanuel. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm super excited to be here. Thanks so much for the invitation and for having me. Um, my name is Emanori Ramanad. I'm currently a visiting assistant professor at Cornell Law School, where I teach uh, first year criminal law and also I teach a seminar on the United States territories. Um, I'm super excited to, to be here again. And I think to, to talk a little bit about my career trajectory, I could take you through all the winding roads, but I'll just tell you sequentially what happened. Um, went to law school and I thought I was gonna go to a law firm. I had an offer, said no, and I went down to South Carolina to work on what's called habeas corpus work. So it's when people are convicted of, um, of crimes, then there's this long kind of trajectory and path where folks can appeal those uh, convictions in different ways. It, it took me all throughout the South, which is really interesting. And I did a lot of stuff that's called mitigation investigation. So I interviewed people in hopes of using that information that we got and to present it as evidence at a court. So I started with that. And then I clerked for a judge, a federal judge. Clerking basically is um, helping the judge with the everyday uh, activities, you know, uh, hearings, helping draft opinions, and then whatever else uh, comes your way uh, during the day. And after that, I was an appellate public defender. So similar to what I was doing in South Carolina, but this time I was working right after, you know, working with uh, our clients right after they got convicted. So we were doing appeals. So I was arguing in front of uh, a panel of judges. So it would usually be three or five different judges. And then after that, I finally decided to go back to the law firm. I was at uh, a law firm called Paul Weiss in New York City, where I was doing commercial litigation. And then I clerked one last time for the First Circuit Court of Appeals. So that's uh, the Court of Appeals at the federal level. We have the trial court, then the Court of Appeals, and then the Supreme Court. So I was in that little middle ground uh, for the late uh, Judge Juan Torruella, who is a Puerto Rican legal luminary, and that's a great segue to say that I'm a proud uh, Boricua, but also I'm half Dominican, so I have to put the plug there too. The, the, I know there's some, some uh, friendly competition between the two of us, and I like to mediate between both. And then finally, I am here now at Cornell Law School, where I teach those two classes that I mentioned in my research focuses on criminal procedure and criminal law, the death penalty, and also the application of federal criminal law in the uh, territories, and sometimes more specifically, Puerto Rico. Thank you. And last but not least, Andrea. Hello, everyone. Good evening. So happy to be with you all today. Um, unfortunately, I came down with a cold, so I sound a little <clears throat> hoarse throughout the presentation. I apologize in advance. <clears throat> I'm currently an associate counsel at Build America Mutual Assurance Company. Um, they are a bond insurance company, and I will get into that when I explain my career trajectory in a bit. Uh, but I was born in Ecuador, came to the U.S. when I was nine years old, and have been in New York ever since. So I'd like to say I'm not a native New Yorker, but a long-term, long-time New Yorker um, since I've been here, since I came here when I was young. I went to college at St. John's University in Queens, law school at Fordham University in New York. Uh, so again, have never left New York. Um, I started my career at White and Case LLP at their New York office. Um, and I was doing capital markets work in um, their capital markets group, which basically representing companies uh, both uh, in the U.S. and internationally, mostly in Latin America with their debt issuances, as well as um, security offerings. So the best way I can explain it, if you hear about IPOs on the headlines, that's basically what I was doing. Um, currently, I'm at Build America or what I call BAM. Um, and what I do is slightly different. Um, I work for a bond insurer company. So where before I was representing companies with their private issuances, I now help finance uh, municipal uh, infrastructure. So roads, airports, water systems, sewer systems, basically the day-to-day -day infrastructure that you see across the United States in your hometowns, um, education buildings, uh, we help finance by basically ensuring the bonds that these municipalities issue. So if you think of your health insurance or your car insurance, um, that insurance company is promising to pay in the event of something happening. Similarly, my company promises bondholders who purchase these bonds from the municipalities to pay in the event that the municipality fails to pay. So in a way, we're helping finance public infrastructure that we all need in the world. So um, something that I like to say is that I am doing public benefit work, which makes me feel good, but I am getting a 
private salary. <laughs> That's always nice. I heard Julie do a little giggle. I also did that inside because that would be the dream. <laughs> um, thanks for that um, introduction from all of you. So the first couple of questions are actually for all panelists. So whoever wants to jump in, please do. Um, starting with wanting to hear more about what led you each to pursue a career in law. I could go first. Um, so as I said before, uh, I'm an immigrant. So I came here when I was about 10 years old. And uh, there is nothing better than being 10 years old and your parents asking you to translate things because they themselves don't know. And so that really was the start and seeing how, you know, so how many so many of our parents getting um, taken advantage of, because I don't know if many of you know, but uh, notario in uh, many of our Latin American countries is a very specific type of lawyer that deals with, you know, certain things. Anyone here could be a notary. You could be a notary if you wanted to. All you have to do is just it's, it's a very simple process and a lot of and a lot of people just, you know, take advantage of, of, of people in our community. And so something along those things happened, uh, not to my parents, but to some people that I knew. And I said, man, I wish someone had told us that. So later on, I just kept seeing, you know, I see everyone, you know, be be an attorney, but I don't see many people like myself. And I decided, well, I want that representation. And so, you know, little kids grow up, see, see a basketball players and they're like, I want to be that. And that's what I thought. I'm like, well, I, you know, I don't really see that. You know, Sonia Sotomayor obviously became like that. And I was just like, wow, there is someone that looks like me that is a judge. Uh, and that to me was a, a very neat experience because I'm like, okay, I feel like uh, if, if, if someone like that can be a judge, then maybe that also is is leads the path to someone like me further in the future being whatever I want to be in the law field. I can go next. Um, I would say my story is similar to Julie's in that I came to this country as an immigrant. Um, the only exposure I had to uh, law is immigration. My family had to adjust their status here. So um, I think that was my first experience with a lawyer and the law in general. Um, so I think just seeing how there was this person that was helping families like mine um, to be able to stay in this country and live here uh, just amazed me. So even before I knew exactly what I wanted to do, that's something that definitely um, brought my attention into the legal field. Uh, and in addition to that, my mom always said that if she hadn't um, had my sister and I and had the opportunity to do something for herself. She always wanted to be a lawyer. So I think that was always in the back of my mind. Um, and then when I went to high school, I took a business law course and we had to present um, a mock trial. Um, and I absolutely loved it. I fell in love with um, the thought of arguing a case for someone um, and just helping in general and thinking back on my immigration uh, days and dealing with the immigration system. Um, I think just during first the idea that I really wanted to be a lawyer and that's what I went with. So the reason why I went to law school was uh, just similar to my career trajectory, a very long winding road. I, you know, went to undergrad and I was, you know, I was interested in a bunch of different things. I was interested in some sciences, was also super interested in political science and history and other humanities. So I was kind of dabbling in all of those things. And then I worked for Professor Sam Roberts, uh, who was writing a book at the time. And my job was very specific. I was out at the Municipal Archives down in, in downtown New York. And I was looking through all of these complaints that were filed against uh, uh, people who were accused of using different types of drugs, uh, particularly we were looking at marijuana. But uh, his book encompassed a lot more than that. And then this is the first time where I had in my hands, you know, the law, if you if you will, right? I, I was looking at these complaints. I was looking at how, at how they read, what these accusations were. And then I started investigating a little bit more with my professor and then seeing how the law really plays one small part in an overarching story of, you know, history, uh, if you're looking backwards and forward, if you're hopefully looking towards progress. And that really piqued my interest. And I thought, and I think my professor uh, and friend now, Sam Roberts, wanted me to do a PhD. And I was thinking about doing the PhD and then I started uh, interning, coincidentally, for Latino Justice, 
and I was I ended up writing my thesis on on the organization. And I thought to myself, the history is cool. I love the history, but there's so much of uh, uh, power in being a, an attorney. This is something that both Julia and I, that I have, have kind of already touched upon. There really is that power to, to protect people and to, to help others. And that's something that I saw myself and really in two different ways. The first one, seeing the uh, injustices that occur in the criminal law uh, system, the criminal justice system here in the United States that I saw first starting to uh, do that research with Sam Roberts, and then also in my everyday life with friends, and then as I started studying more in school, that you know sense of injustice really uh, prompted that idea in my head to become a public defender. But then there also the sense of injustice that occurs in other parts of this country. I've mentioned you know the U.S. territory several times, Puerto Rico, almost all of my family, even my Dominican side of the family, most of them live in, in Puerto Rico. People in the U.S. territories are treated differently than folks in the rest of the 50 states. Of the United. Some parts of the Constitution, the Supreme Court has said, doesn't apply to those people. That's another in, uh, significant injustice. And those things taken together prompted me to, to go to law school. And who knows, maybe I should have gotten the Ph.D. anyways, because now I'm, I'm teaching. So, you know, this is a long kind of uh, circle that, that has happened. But those two really uh, deep senses of injustice that I, that I saw um, in my undergrad really propelled me to, to apply to law school. So now that we understand more about your motivations, I'd like to hear um, what the process of selecting and applying to law school was like for each of you. And again, no particular order, so whoever wants to jump in, I would just ask that you keep your answers to one or two minutes, um, given that we have a lot of questions you want to get through. I, I can also go. <laughs> um, the process was so th there was two processes for me. So when I was a junior in law school in in college at FSU, I took a prep course. One of the things that I did actually before doing that was I knew I didn't have money. So I was just like, OK, so how am I able to pay for all of these applications? Because this is going to be really expensive and to pay for a prep course for the LSAT. So I looked at a lot of different options online. I am a Google master. Actually, no, I just like to Google. And so I found different things. And something that I recommend to some of you is look up undergraduate law programs. And so FSU has one. Florida State University has summer for undergraduate programs. I know Ohio Moritz uh, School of Law also has another one. There are a few schools that have them. So I applied for it. I ended up getting in. And they paid, you know, it was, a, it was a summer at the law school. I was able to take classes. And they also gave me a voucher, which uh, served to do a prep course. Uh, I took the prep course. I didn't really do that well. But I applied to different law schools and I got into a few ones. But some of the, some of the money, I was just, this, this isn't enough. I really can't, can afford this. So I decided, well, I'm going to take two years. I'm going to take a year off of first. And so I took a year off. Um, and decided I still need more money to save. And so I waited and I took another year, um, took the LSAT and then um, started to apply for different schools. Um, my main, main consideration at that point was who's going to give me the most money, prestige, uh, also proximity to home because for me, it was, you know, my, my parents, I only have my mom in this country. So I wanted to make sure that I was in the same, um, basically, coast. I didn't want to be more than three to five hours on a plane. Uh, I just ended up choosing one that was within uh, driving distance from Miami to West Palm. So uh, it, they happened to give me, in a sense, the best deal. Um, and that's the way I chose it. For me, I thinking about it, maybe I would have gone to some other schools. But I don't regret my choice because at the end of the day, I was really grateful to have that family support and like know that if anything was to happen, that I could just like, you know, go to my parents. Um, so. Um, I guess I can go next. <laughs> um, I guess the best way I can describe it and not to scare anyone, but I'm just being honest, the law school application process is definitely intimidating especially for people like us who don't know lawyers, who have no lawyers in their family, or who have no access to advice from people who know how to apply to law school, get your application ready. So I found that whole process extremely intimidating. But like Julie, I also found a program through my school, um, St. John's, uh, called the Ronald H. Brown Prep Program um, that's offered to St. John's and other schools in the area. 
Um, I applied for it. And similarly to Julie, they offered me law school classes just to prepare me for the law school experience. Um, they helped me write my personal statement and also gave me um, a voucher for an LSAT prep course that wasn't as long as a regular course. It was a condensed one. Um, so I didn't get to take a full course like most people do, um, but I still found it helpful. It helped me prepare for the LSAT. Um, when I graduated and got my LSAT score, actually, I was not happy with it. I freaked out and thought that it was just too low for me to get into anywhere decent. Um, so I ended up putting it off, did not apply to law school, um, and then ended up taking what was supposed to be a short, brief break until I retook my LSAT and it turned into almost a four-year break. Um, and I actually reapplied because I got a notification that my LSAT was expiring. Ended up saying, I'm leaving it up to God, not retaking the LSAT. At this point, I have work experience, better recommendation letters, a better personal statement that was reviewed by the lawyers I was working for. So I ended up just going for it and only applied in New York. Again, similar to Julie, I wanted to stay close to my mom and my family who were in New York. So I only applied to New York-based schools. I didn't apply to Columbia or NYU. I chickened out because of my LSS score, but I applied everywhere else and ended up choosing Fordham. Uh, for many reasons, including the alumni network, their um, percentage of employment after graduation, and also um, it was my dream school for college. So I figured it was a full circle moment for me. I think my story is less uh, riveting than both of your stories. I just <laughs> uh, took all of my, and I know we'll talk about this later as well, but I took all of the little small savings I had for my paid gigs during law, uh, during undergrad and Toss them all into my into the uh, my like plan to apply far and wide, and then after that, I think I fell into the, essentially. I think that's a, a great thing. Both of you said, you know, picking the school based off geography, and then also, uh, you know, the opportunities you think that school is going to give you. Something that I had um, also in the back of my head was going back to a place that had a smaller class size because I went to a school undergrad which had, a, uh, even though it's not one of those schools with you know tens of thousands of people in your undergrad, it was still a lot bigger than where I went to high school. I went to high school, 150 students. I love that small classroom experience. And then, so I ended up at, at Cornell Law School, which, you know, I kind of mixed all those things that both of you have said already. Uh, you know, the, the, the prestige factor is close enough to home. It's, four, you know, three hours and some change. If you're, you know, if you're uh, not respecting the speed limit, it should be three hours and 50 minutes from, from uh, where my parents live in New Jersey, if you are. But that's close enough, right, for, for us, um, for my family. So it mixed all those things and the small class size as well was uh, ended up being something I really was looking for and something that was extremely beneficial for, for me as well. So that was my journey, just applying far and wide and seeing what's what stuck. And then from there, making that uh, kind of narrowing decision that, that we've mentioned already. So this question is for Julie and Emmanuel specifically, and you guys already touched on this a bit, but I wanna hear what resources did you find the most helpful when you were applying to law school? For example, did you take an LSAT prep course or did you have someone reviewing your application? Things like that. So uh, it's going to be interesting because we're going to have very different because uh, I, for me, I, I knew that standardized testing was in my, my cup of tea. It's never been my forte. So I was just like, I need a prep course. Thankfully, one was already paid for me. But the second time I took it, I had to pay for it. And believe me, that was just like handing over that money uh, not getting paid, you know, that much. And so it, it was a big sacrifice, but it was a, a sacrifice that you need to. If this is something, you know, law school is something that is very expensive. It's a very expensive endeavor. And if you're going to take it, make sure that you're setting yourself up for the right course. Your LSAT is one of the most important factors in the scholarship process. Let's say you give up your summer, and you end up getting, I don't know, more than a 165. Okay, you're Hispanic. You now have a 165. PA is more than like 3.3. You have much better possibilities of getting scholarships just based on this small number. But also, if you, you know, you take it, you don't do well, don't also fret. There are ways of making sure that, you know, they get better. Um, and one of the things that, um, uh, helping like review my application, um, I ended up asking 
my professors, friends. I asked anyone if they would be basically would be able to to help me review my application because I thought that that was something that was, you know, extremely important that, you know, sometimes you yourself, like I'm very good at reviewing other people's stuff, but my stuff, not, not at all. Sometimes I can't see, you know, the, the forest from the trees and, and that very much is um, with your writing. Um, but also I, I took a look at different websites. Um, so some of you can look at, it's called Miss JD. Um, this is one of the websites that I saw. They also had a lot of resources for people applying um, for law school. Also um, SEO, um, if you just Google SEO law, um, there are some of these programs that are like pre-law school that help you get basically into law school. They give you um, some money. Um, you just have to Google basically like pre-law school programs. They're they're extremely you know helpful um, in in your chance to both go to law school, maybe help you pay for some things, and just knowledge. Any knowledge that you get is necessary because this is going to be an arduous task, especially for those of us who are first gen everything. You're going to call yourself and you're going to call yourself into question a lot of times. And so at least having someone that has already been through it is just very necessary and very helpful. I can't stress enough that point of how important it is, in my view, to take a course. It, I think it is very, very important. I did not really take one of these long courses. I took a small, really accelerated course that was very cheap. Uh, and my thought process was, I'm a senior in college, I'm tired, but maybe I can do something here, learn a little bit and transfer it over while I'm studying it by myself. Uh, it, you know, it worked out, but I think it would it would have been a lot better had I took that long course instead of doing 90% of the studying on my own. I bought the, uh, you know, certain books. They have all sorts of books. I bought some books that I think they're called Power Score. And then I studied them as if they were another course. And it was all by myself. But then there's a bunch of questions that inevitably pop up and you have nobody else to ask except going back into the book and trying to, to figure it out. It's, if you have an LSAT instructor through one of these courses, you could just ask this person and get the question back immediately. They review the way you answered it, stuff like that. Because at the end of the day, the LSAT, just like any other standardized test, it's not so much about you know how smart you are. It's definitely not about that. I could guarantee that. It's not about how smart you are. It's about how good you are at taking this exam. And some people, they're just wired to take those types of exams. Excellent, it went well for them, perfect. Other people, not so wired for that. They have to take uh, you know classes or read these books in order to kind of switch the, the way you're approaching it so that you can be a good exam taker. And that's really the uh, the kind of the, the central problem here. That you just have to learn how to take this test. And I really think that taking that class is the best best way to do it because if not, you will be, uh, I think, struggling <laughs> sometimes a, a lot more than you should struggle through, through these things. They are expensive. That's definitely true. If I recall, I think they're probably a, a thousand, maybe even a couple of thousand dollars. But I, I, I'm just speaking off the top of my head. I'm not really sure how much they are. That's a lot of money. You know, that's a lot of money. But if it, I think it's worth the investment if you're going all in on the application. Now, for the reviewing of the materials and things like that, I relied a lot on my um, on my professors that I was close to in undergrad. And I also relied a lot on um, mentors that, that I had along the way, uh, folks at uh, Latino Justice who reviewed my materials. And also uh, my, my older brother. I have an older brother. He's three years older than me. He... Uh, he is, has no problem correcting my, my work. I think he sometimes takes too much uh, joy in doing so, but he does a great job at it. But leaning on your friends, leaning on your mentors, leaning on that support system to, to, to help you through that process is really important. And then I just want to reiterate a really great point you made about both the LSAT and I'll just throw in the bar exam being these gatekeeping tasks that have nothing to do with your skills or intelligence. Unfortunately, you just got to learn how to take the test. So it's definitely worth the investment. I know it is pricing, but it's worth the investment. I think um, it'll pay off in the long run because as Julie said, it could really help with scholarships when you enter law school. Um, speaking of costs associated with law school, here is a fun question um, that probably keeps us, all, keeps us all up at night, maybe just me. But can you talk a little bit about how you funded law school? Um, and please try to keep your answers to like 30 seconds to a minute. How did you fund law school? Well, applying to, I would definitely recommend fee waivers. That's what I used. Um, 
the LSAC offers fee waivers uh, to apply to law school. Uh, so the process is a little bit difficult to explain, but if you go on the LSAC uh, website, you'll be able to see the process there. But the fee waiver basically covers uh, your reports that you're going to be sending out to about six law schools. And then after six, then you will have to pay for those. Uh, but each report costs about $45, I believe. So that is a hefty amount. Uh, and that's not counting the CAS registration. I forgot what the acronym means, but that's basically the system that you will use to send your law school applications. And that alone costs almost $200. So the fee waiver will cover that. And of course, there's eligibility requirements based on your income. But again, you can look in the LSAT website and um, see if you're eligible. And also, you know, meeting admissions officers sometimes can help with that same exact uh, um, problem about you know actually paying for the for the application process. They can offer you fee waivers. Sometimes, if you wait late enough in the game, they'll send them out. I don't know what you know what rhyme or reason they're doing it, but I don't know where you'll get an email that you know X Y Z Law School has waived it. So you know, if you can also reach out apart from that, which is it was certainly a really important point. I also I think I mentioned previously I worked in. Uh, for most of my undergrad, and I just used all that money. I mean, it, I, I kind of, by the time I was a junior or senior, I knew that I was going to be using that money. So, um, you know, I had a, luckily I had a paid internship my summer and during the entire year of my senior year of college. So I used, I think, basically every single dollar there to, to apply to law school. Yeah, um, I, I also had, at one point I had like three jobs during college, but I think I spent maybe like $1,000 applying to law school. Um, it was a very, very expensive endeavor. But as a, Andrea was saying, um, LSAC, and sometimes, you know, just email everyone. You don't know if they're going to say yes or no. What do you have to lose? I feel like at that point, it's better to, you know, no one is going to, well, except sometimes they do send you, as, as Emmanuel said, free um, uh, waivers. But you might as well just also just do it. You reach out. Um, and for attending law school, well, I took on a lot of law school debt, but also I applied to a lot of different scholarships. And, you know, <laughs> my scholarships, one particular scholarship was 18000 Other scholarships were 5000 Others were $500. I applied to every single thing, poquito por poquito. Like, you know, I, it was, even if it was $200, it was $200 that I certainly didn't have. And it's $200 less that I took out in loans. So I would just suggest going for every law school, every every application that you're going to go once you're already in law school and even before, you know, um, applying, um, just because even if the amount is small, this is money that you didn't have and this is money that you don't have to take out in loans. And I feel like you do have to consider that that loan amount. Uh, but I will tell you, like my like my student loans are, are pretty hefty, but I wouldn't have my job nor realistically my salary if if i didn't have this this sort of that um i feel like the return on investment hopefully will be fine but i i it was something that i had to consider something i would just add is folks should apply early if possible i didn't realize that when i was applying i thought well i'll just wait until last minute because then i can have all this time to put my application together and it'll be perfect and i'll have more time to study for the lsat not realizing that there's early admission and the people who are early admitted get a lot of money. And as seats get filled, they have less and less money to offer to you. So that was a lesson I learned the hard way, you know, because I applied very late in the game. And by then, not only was I facing more competition because a lot of seats were already filled, but also the schools had already, you know, handed out a ton of money. So my advice, if you want to like help yourself is apply early. Um, this next question is for Andrea. Can you tell us about the most challenging or surprising thing for you about law school? Uh, sure. I certainly have a couple of them. Um, the first one, of course, uh, that comes to mind is the lack of diversity, which I don't think is should have been a surprise, but it certainly was, um, especially because my college uh, in Queens, obviously it's also New York, uh, was a very, very diverse school so I came sort of expecting that. And then when I entered law school and saw just how very few Latinos or even black students there were, I was quite shocked. 
in my section, which had about 65 students. Um, I was one of, I believe, four Latinos and Latinas in the class. Um, and then in the class, I'm not sure the entire class, the number, but there were not that many. Um, so I think I found that very surprising and shocking because law school is already a difficult environment. And to add the feeling of you being one of the few people that look like you in that space can be, again, intimidating. Um, another surprising thing I found is how competitive law school can be. Um, as you may know, law school grades you on a curve. Uh, so it's blind grading. Um, so I think a lot of people take that to heart and just try to be as competitive as they can be. Luckily, Fordham um, was not that competitive or cutthroat. I have heard horror stories from other law schools, but um, luckily that was not my experience. There were a few people that were not pleasant, but you get to know those people right away and you can easily avoid them. Um, so that was the second surprising thing. And lastly, I will say just the method of teaching, which is unlike anything I had experienced before. In college, a lot of your courses are usually lectures. You just sit there, take notes. Sometimes you don't even have to take notes. No one really pays attention to you. You get in college what you put in it. Um, law school is not like that. Um, you're expected to come prepared with your readings. You're expected to know what is being discussed. You're expected to participate in class. And even if you're not um, looking to participate, they will make you. Um, they teach under the Socratic method so that you will get what they call cold called. Um, so you can randomly be called on to speak about that case or that particular subject matter, and you just have to be prepared to do so. And um, I'll just add to that. One thing that I found surprising about law school as somebody who wanted to go into public interest and do civil rights work was the lack of support there was for that. Um, one thing that I was not expecting was that there would be a lot of support for folks who want to go private or go corporate. And, you know, we had constantly different big law firms um, at our law school recruiting people. But as somebody who wanted to do public interest, I felt like I really had a hustle for every opportunity. Not only that, but at the time, my law school didn't even provide um, summer fellowships. So you can imagine as a first generation student from a low income background, that's very, very challenging. Um, I had to like just ask family members for different loans in order to af afford that, including working for a judge. Um, and everybody knows that, um, well, and you'll learn this once you get in law school, working for a judge is very prestigious. And um, after law school, you can do clerkships like Emmanuel shared. And clerkships, clerkships can help you get even better jobs in the future. But it's really hard to even get your foot in the door without funding without support for that. So I found that to be really shocking. So what I always tell people is to make sure that the law school that you're looking into, if you want to do public interest, make sure that they have some sort of funding mechanism to support your work, whether it be summer fellowships for public interest, or there's a program called LRAP, Loan Repayment Assistance, uh, Loan Repayment Assistance Program. And not all schools have them, but I know a lot of schools have it. Again, it's called LRAP. But essentially, um, the school that has an LRAP program will help you pay off your student loans post law school, which is really helpful because another fun fact about public interest, you don't get paid very well. Um, so it can be very challenging to pay back your student loans. And I had to take out a lot of student debt to go to law school because I couldn't afford it otherwise. Um, but because of the LRAP program, my school was making up to 100% of my payments each month because of my income. Um, a lot of them are income based, so you might get out of it at some point. Hopefully you do. But I found that to be very helpful because, again, um, you're going to want that support if you're going the public interest route. And then, of course, there's a public service loan forgiveness program. Unfortunately, it's been in the news a lot lately for all the bad reasons, but it looks like they really are turning things around. But I would just consider, you know, public service loan forgiveness. Um, essentially, you would have to work two, 10 years for public service um, and make your payments on time for 10 years, and then your debt would be forgiven, will be forgiven. I, mean, I think I'm like six years into the program now, um, so, so fingers crossed it all pans out. Um, but, you know, you really do want to think about these things because I think we take the debt kind of lightly, but also we don't really have an option, but you should just understand, you know, the range of your options post-law school and also during law school. So I know we only have about 20 minutes left, so we're going to try to get through as many of these questions as possible. I want to hear more about what your guys' day-to-day -day at law school was like and any tips you have on being successful or just making it through law school. And because of the time crunch, I'll ask you guys to keep your answers sweet and short, like 30 seconds. Whoever wants to go can go ahead. 
over really quickly um it was just a, a whole lot of like reading revising um you know like uh, doing little um my notes i would write well for me I, and i would recommend this for everyone write out your notes do if do not type because when you're typing you're transcribing it's just you know and all of us are becoming are really fast typers so writing really is a way of making sure that you know you're you're um you know, processing the information, go to your um, office hours. Your professors are there for you. Make sure you have, you know who your professors are. They know who you are. You can ask them questions. Um, I know it's, I know it's difficult and I know sometimes they're scary, but they are really willing to help you. That really, for me, the success I had in school was because I had, thankfully, uh, my professors were the ones who helped me. I had also like some of my classmates were really huge support. They were my emotional support. They were just, you know, the people that I would study with. Um, make sure that you have a good group and make sure that also when you're doing study groups, the collective knowledge is not the individual knowledge. If you don't know something, you have to speak up and you have to figure it out yourself. Just because everyone in your study group is just like, oh yeah, no, I got it, does not mean that you have it. Make sure that you are understanding it yourself. I'd say that um, apart from that, your first year is very different than your second and third year. Your first year is kind of set up for you. you everybody does the same thing, essentially. And then second, third year, I like to say, is like a choose your own adventure type of thing where you can choose to just take the same type of classes or doctrinal classes, the same type of classes, like, you know, criminal law, civil procedure, which are the ones that typically people take their first year. And then you can do all sorts of other things in your second and third year. Um, such as clinics. Clinics, essentially, you're working at many law firms within your law school that help do all sorts of things. Um, you know, there's usually an immigration clinic at every single law school nowadays where you can help people apply for asylum or all sorts of other things. And then there's also some even more specific and particular ones, like there's a securities litigation clinic at certain places. I don't really know what they do because I never took it and I never worked in securities, but it sounds fun for people who like that. So it's really fun that you can actually work in all different sorts of areas once you're second and third year students. Some schools let you do that as a one out, but most schools uh, don't have that uh, ability. So at first year, wake up. For me, I woke up, cooked myself a little bit of breakfast. I can tell you by the, by the end of the semester, I was not cooking myself that breakfast anymore. And then I would just read, read, notes, go to class, read, notes, go to class, eat, go to the gym. That's it, just 24 slash seven, that was my thing. And then second year, a little bit more relaxing. It's a little bit more uh, stressful sometimes with certain things because then you can get involved in student groups, which I think is a lot of fun. There's these things called journals, which are essentially uh, like per periodicals that law professors and practitioners and judges and all these people will write articles and then students get to edit them. And it's, it's fun if you know if you people want to get involved with that. So, you know, again, first year, just studying. Second, third year, you get to do all these other different things and uh, you get to make your own schedule, really. I have some friends who uh, had a very nice time studying abroad. I externed for a semester. I was in New York City working at Athena Justice for an entire semester. So you get to do a, a lot of uh, a lot of cool things in your second year. Yeah, so I think Emmanuel did a good job covering all three years, so I won't even get into that. Uh, my first year was a little different. Um, I was actually an evening student, so for people who are worried about being able to pay for law school, that is an option for you. There are a couple of law schools that do offer evening programs, so you can go to school part-time and then keep your full-time job. There were a lot of people in my class who did that, um, and I was one of them. So for me, I was balancing both a full-time job and part-time law school. Um, so I would study, read my cases for the day during my lunch breaks, would mostly study during the weekends because that's the only time that I had. Um, and in law school, you uh, are expected to brief your cases, and that's basically just a summary of your cases. Uh, and that's just so you have that prepared in case you do get called on. Um, so the weekends I mostly use to spend time outlining, and that's just the compilation of your class notes, your briefs of any course material um, that you have, as well as any supplement or study aids that you use. And that's what you use to both prepare for your finals and sometimes even to take them. Um, another surprising thing, which I should have mentioned, a lot of law school exams are open book um, because you do rely on your outline to take them. Um, and what helped me be successful, I will say, the first year, at least, definitely prioritize school. Um, people don't lie to you when they say that you really do have no social life because you don't. Um, so I think just realizing that and just coming prepared that 
you know, you're not going to have time to hang out with your friends or your family as much as before. And just your focus should be on doing the best you can, but of course, um, balance it out so that you continue to take care of yourself. Another question for all panelists, what should people try to achieve in law school? Like if there is one or two things that you say, you definitely want to achieve this in law school. I would say variety. Variety because it's the only time you're going to be able to go from uh, maybe a securities arbitration clinic, which yes, that, that is what I did, <laughs> but also I externed for Nokia. Um, and, you know, I was able to also intern for a judge. So I had this very, very different sort of experiences um, and, you know, clinics, externships, um, those th kinds of things you're going to be able to do, you know, after your second year um, and during the summers. And they're going and it's more important to know what you don't like than it is what you do like, because at least you cross it off. Um, I think that that is something important is variety. Um, enjoy, enjoy what you're doing um, and, and try to do as much as you can. You're going to have different experiences. You'll be able to pick. Yeah, I would say uh, two things. Definitely good grades. I know that it's a lot of pressure to think that grades are this big thing. They're not everything. Um, so when I preface by saying that they're not everything, but they are important, especially for um, some industries like um, corporate law, um, they are very, very important. So if that's something that you are aiming for. Your grades do matter. So I will definitely try to strive to do well my first year. Um, and the second thing, and I think a couple of people have already mentioned this, make friends. These people are your uh, friends in law school and then later your colleagues in the professional world and the legal field is not as big as it sounds. It's actually very small and people do know each other. Um, so I would say make friends. Um, it was hard going through law school and not being able to speak to my friends or my family about it. They don't really understand what it is you're going through, but the people you're going to law school with do. Um, so have that support system with you even during law school and even after. Yeah, I agree with everything folks have said so far. If I would add something, it would probably be that apart from exploring, because that's extremely important, you should also probably think about certain markers of, of you know, maybe you could say something around the lines of markers of success that might help you down the line. And it all really depends on what you're thinking about doing. Some industries, as Andrea alluded to, require certain things. Um, it could be great. So I totally agree with that. You should always strive to get as best grades as, as you can. And then because um, that'll open doors. But there's also some other markers that uh, of success that um, certain industries look, look for. And I'm not saying that you have to do these, but I'm saying that you should probably keep them on, uh, you know, on the table for, for, for you to perhaps do. So I mentioned law journals, for example. There's certain industries that that's very important that you uh, are on a journal, sometimes on a very specific type of journal. That they're looking for. So most schools have plenty of opportunities, you know, three, four, five different journals for people to have that experience. So that might be something that's really important. What are some industries that like that? Well, um, I, I know that a, a lot of the older judges, for example, love to see that uh, when you're applying for a full-time job with them, the, the clerkship that we've been talking about. Academia loves to see that as well. Certain law firms also ask for those things. So you kind of have to have your ear down on the floor to see what's going on in those certain different types of of industries. Clinics, for example, are very important in my experience for um, if you're going into public interest. You can't really have a lot of experience if you don't do clinics. And then when you're interviewing for folks, even as fellows or as full-time staff positions, they want to see that experience. They want to see that commitment to that um, particular area of the law that you're trying to get um, involved with. So there's certain little things that, that, um, for, that are pretty industry specific that I would suggest folks to um, to think about when they're they're in law school, perhaps doing, and then also not doing if it's not uh, needed for your for your industry. And I know that a lot of people worry about not knowing what type of lawyer they want to be ahead of law school. I would say like you should not be worrying about that right now, and you should think of law school as an opportunity to try out different types of things and even different types of lawyering. Try out direct services. Try out student clubs, clinics, journals mock trial and see what you like. You don't have to know the answers right now because you don't know the scope of what's even available. So I would say like put that on the back burner, focus on getting into law school 
focused on being successful in law school, the career trajectory will come. But now I'd like to hear more about your guys' current roles. Um, and I know that you all shared that uh, in some form, in a, uh, in some form in a, or another, you identify as first-generation professionals. I'd love to hear what challenges, if any, you experienced in pursuing your legal career path as being a trailblazer, essentially. Um, I would say for me, um, and I'm sure a lot of people can relate, uh, one of the biggest challenges was dealing with uh, the very real imposter syndrome. Um, and I dealt with that both in law school and uh, when I entered um, the workforce. And if you're not familiar with the term, it's basically just a, a feeling where you're questioning your abilities, you're questioning your worth, and whether you even deserve to be where you are. Um, and that comes from a lot of places, but it's mostly in women. It's mostly in un people from underrepresented backgrounds. Um, and I experienced it all the time. Um, so I had to definitely self-talk, um, just tell myself that I did deserve to be there, remind myself daily that it was uh, somewhere that I deserved to be because I had worked hard. So it was definitely challenging for me at the beginning. Um, and actually still is to this day. Um, and then another one I would say was definitely just dealing with the, I wouldn't say backlash, but I can't think of a better word at the moment, but just I feel like in our community, the expectation is that um, we should go out there and help the world and go out there and do public interest. Um, so I do feel like a lot of people have viewed me negatively because I didn't choose to do that. Uh, and I instead went to private practice. But to people that are in my shoes, I would say not to worry about that because you can give back to others differently. It doesn't have to be what you do in your career. I'm currently in private practice, but I do things um, in my spare time to help others. This event is proof of it. I'm here speaking to people, hoping that my advice can help you. I mentor students. I've also done a ton of pro bono immigration work. So um, I think those have been my biggest challenges. Yeah, that's a that's a great uh, well all those were great uh, points that I really resonated the the imposter syndrome one because apart from the way that you had mentioned it also from time to time people say certain things that I wouldn't even call them microaggressions they're just aggressions you know for so I recall for for example my first summer internship I was with the Bronx defenders and in, in the Bronx we went to the courthouse and I was working with my supervising attorney and I'm you know we're allowed to stand next to them up there or uh, two L's and three L's actually get to argue for certain things. So I'm a one L, you know, going into my second year. Uh, so I should, sorry, I should say three L's are able to argue. I'm going into my second year, this is my summer in between. I remember uh, the, the um, I, I guess he was the bailiff, but one of the security guards there telling me to like sit in a particular location and that particular location is where the defendant sits. And, you know, I wish I could say I was surprised that it happened. I wasn't, it's unfortunate it did happen, but of course th that happens often. Often, and this is like a story that people who actually work every single day in those courts, until they become familiar with this, with the different people or the staff that are there, that will occur to them many times. And this will occur to people all across uh, different uh, legal industries as well. So that, you know, if it's going to happen, and then the, the spinoff to that, which is something that I really struggle with, and I'm hoping that I'm doing a better job every day, it's kind of this idea of just staying in your lane. You know, so many people are doing so many different things, and you just really have to stay true to yourself. And it's really easy for you to kind of open your eyes and see what other people are doing, kind of follow that path and get grilled from, you know, what it is you truly want to do and um, something that you truly want to do. And that could also benefit uh, other people. I have tons of friends similar to Amadeo who are doing private practice and try to give back in as many ways as possible. I have tons of friends who are doing public interest and, they, you know, that's their passion and they're doing great direct service work as well. So really just putting your, you know, kind of at some point putting your blinders on and saying, Hey, I, I'm also a person. I'm not putting the entire Latino community on my back. We have many people coming through, including most, you know, all the people here on the, on, on the, uh, the, in the audience. We can share the the, the burden and we, we can also be true to ourselves as well. I think that for me, it was a question of, uh, in a sense, confidence, because uh, what I do is just very different than anything most people will ever do which is audit a very specific agency and that's DOD. So I had to learn completely a new language, what two entirely too many acronyms meant 
And I kept doubting myself. And then, you know, there comes a point where you have to tell yourself, like, no, I was chosen for this role for a reason. I have the skills. Like, I am able to do this. And it's gaining that confidence. But let me tell you that imposter syndrome is that, you know, it still is something that still, like, permeates. And I'm like, can I do this? Can I, you know, will I do this? Sometimes, am I deserve it? Is it just luck? And it sucks. But, you know, it's something that you're going to go through. You're going to keep at it. But slowly you chip away by realizing that, you know, you are at the point of, you know, wherever your career and you're going to continue doing it and you have to keep working hard. And sometimes you're going to have to work twice as hard, maybe as a woman, maybe as a minority, maybe as, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that you are. And you're going, that's, that's just the way it is. Unfortunately, that's the, the those are the cards that you were dealt with. And, and that's the reality of the situation. But you have to be very true to yourself. Um, you know, if you're someone, you know, you want to make sure that you don't lose that part of yourself. That if you are someone that's gregarious, that's someone fun, that's someone that's, um, you know, you you don't lose that just to fit into the mold. Make sure that obviously it's work appropriate, I will say. But make sure that, you know, you are being true to yourself. And sometimes that, you know, your first job is not your last job you too can pivot. Um, and you have a whole community, including all of us who are able to help you, you know, sometimes reaching out to people is the most important part and realizing that you're not alone. You didn't do this by yourself, because all of us have had help in some way. And all of us are there to also pay it forward. We're, all of us are here because we want to help. So last question, and I think this is a really important one. You know, today we've talked a lot about things that are very stressful. And in fact, hearing them back, it's like a trauma response almost. I'm like, oh my God, that was like a terrible time for me, applying to law school, going to law school. It's very stressful, right? And we know now life as a lawyer is also very stressful. So I want to hear, and I think it's important for audience to hear, how do you guys maintain health? Whether it be emotional, physical, mental health, all of the above, what are your tips to maintaining a healthy life? And this is for everyone. I'm happy to start that. I'm actually very excited for this question. I think it's extremely important. Um, in law school, and even when I began my career, I wasn't very good at taking care of myself. I think I put a lot of emphasis on getting good grades. And then when I entered my firm, just doing a good job, I was working very long hours. And although I did do a lot of exercise and worked out whenever I could, I just forgot the, the importance of your mental health. I was just so used to always feeling stressed all the time that I normalized my anxiety to the point that I think the pandemic really revealed how bad my anxiety was. And it made it like opened up my mind, my eyes to the idea that I, I was ignoring that side of my health. Um, and I think part of it is because there's a taboo, at least in the Latin community, about mental health. It's not really discussed. Uh, people just shy away from it. The idea of a therapist, oh my God, that's just scary. Uh, but I actually started therapy um, last year, at the end of last year, and it has been completely life-changing. And had I started this process when I was in law school, um, I think things would have been very different for me. Um, and therapy is just nothing scary. Um, it can be intimidating, but it's, it's not. It's just someone that is an outlet for you to deal with situations, whether it's relationships or law school or a job, um, and just gives you tools to work through those things. So I would highly recommend therapy. Absolutely take some time out of your day to do some exercise. Yoga has been an outlet for me. I find it very relaxing, soothing, and has also helped with my anxiety. So those will be my two main tips. I, I echo Andrea uh, completely what she said. I think that mental health, especially, I don't know for, you know, I was a 2019 graduate, so I had only about six months of my actual career that I went to the office and the rest has been, you know, working from home. And it's different because then, you know, you're used to going into the office, there's people that you can go to and now Maybe you're more afraid of, you know, knocking on the door. Now you're, you, now you have to, I am a person. It's not like you're seeing them. So a lot of these things, you know, they, they do take a toll. And so how do I manage it? I cook a lot. I love cooking. So that's like the way that I, I sort of get my things out. 
but then you go the, the wrong route and then you overeat. So then you have to like, be like, Oh yeah, you know, I have to actually get this, get this together. Um, yoga is a good thing. I also paint, um, you know, I just, a lot of different like arts and crafts to be quite honest, have been like sort of like my relief and also knowing most importantly is like knowing when I was just like, there is something wrong with me. Like, Mental health wise, I was just like, whoa, I all of a sudden I like feel really weird. And so like talking to someone like therapist is, is, is an important part. And like, you know, not letting those the stereotypes of unfortunately our culture is that say, I know, you know, like if you if you go to a therapist, it's that local, you know, only crazy people go to like therapists. Um, that's that's incorrect. All of us have some sort of maybe maybe, you know, trauma or for whatever or not necessary trauma. But, you know, sometimes even our good friends, no one has the tools that a therapist or, you know, has. Um, and being able to reach out to someone and say, like, hey, like, I need this um, or medication, that's important. Remember, you, th you're here for the long run. So, you know, mental health is just one aspect of your health that you have to take care of. And as Latinos also, please, you know, Go do actually your physical. That is also important. You know, we are higher risk of diabetes, you know, heart, uh, you know, our heart health, all of that kind of stuff. So especially during these times, encourage your parents. You know, that's just my two cents. I'll be quick here. Uh, I agree with that. I think that everybody should go to therapy. Even when you, you know, you think you're all gravy, you're all good go you, you you'd be surprised what little thing is in the deepest part of your brain that's coming out in different odd ways and when you're of course you absolutely need you should absolutely go as well i'll also say something that kind of has been said a little bit but i'd like to emphasize it which is don't let your passions leave you right if you're passionate about doing something continue to do it if you know make time for that it's gonna uh you know one thing that i've learned is there's this choice that at one point needs to be made, which is, you know, are you going to be consumed? If you have the choice, sometimes you don't have the choice, but if you do have the choice, are you going to choose to be consumed by your work or are you going to make time for yourself? And, you know, sometimes there's a balance to be made. Sometimes you have to be all in. Sometimes you choose to be all in. And uh, I, I think that it's been very helpful to choose more often myself to go ex continue exploring those passions and, uh, you know, finding new ones as well is always helpful. So I, you know, I play a lot of musical instruments. I love playing. I, I still play at my, uh, my church band. It's fun. It's great. I love it for the spiritual aspect, but I also love playing drums. So, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to be there as many Sundays as possible. I also play a lot of sports. So I play uh, soccer with, with, uh, you know, local leagues and stuff like that. Um, nothing too intense because it's supposed to be fun, right? Not, not uh, <laughs> adversarial as the, as the rest of the learning world is for the most part, but don't lose those passions because you have to make time for yourself. Otherwise you'll be consumed and, and that can lead towards a, a pretty dangerous path, which is why mental health is such a big issue for everybody really in the country, but also for specifically for lawyers as well. So we have to make time for ourselves. And I, I would just say never underestimate the power of trash TV. It could definitely lighten the mood, take your mind off things, right? That's my go-to. I'm like, just give me a good Housewives episode and I'll forget and all about work. Right, all of it, all of it. All right. Um, so I did want to jump into audience questions. We had a lot of really good questions. Um, so I am going to pick a few here. Um, starting with um, this person asks, what do you recommend for someone considering a, ch a career change to law after doing something completely different? Do you think um, that this person should still take some sort of course to prepare? Is there an undergrad course or a pre-law course that they should be taking? Um, and do you think that, uh, or do you think there's something that could help them figure out if this is something they should actually pursue, this career change? Um, one good piece of advice that I would suggest um, is attending events like these. That's a great start. Um, actually, there's a lot of student-run organizations that are related to law school. One of them, um, well, in the New York area at least, is Metro Lhasa, but you also have HMBA, HBA. You also have NELSA, which is the National uh, Latino Law Student Association. They have conferences yearly, and they put on panels about different areas of the law. They bring in practitioners from all over the world. And you get to hear about what these people do. You get to network. Um, and I think that would be a great exposure just to learn about what's out there, learn about different areas of the law. 
Um, and then if you start like that, you can really see if maybe a particular area is of interest to you and whether law school is actually the right move for you. Great, let me dive into another question here. Um, what strategies did you all employ to succeed in competitive law school courses? I think that's a really good question. Outlining, for me, it was a question of like, I, so for my first year, everyone will tell you, you need to go to a study group. The study groups are the greatest thing. Well, that was not my thing because I knew that for me, I'm like, that's, this is not the way I'm going to, to really study and understand it. I only had one person I would study with, and that's because we understood each other. And because for me, I knew that I needed to teach it to someone in order for me to understand it. So that was a huge deal for me. Like knowing your your method of learning is important. Are you a visual learner? Are you more of like, you know, if, if you can ask the professor if you are, um, you can record the classes and hear it. Or are you more like a flashcard person? You have to know what style suits you best. That's why I, I was telling you all, you know, I handwrite everything so it I understand it. So like my brain is digesting it for me and sticky notes. For me, writing it, sticky notes, a whole lot and going to my professors and being able to talk to them. That's the way I studied. Um, that really was my strategy for, for exams and, and you know, uh, mnemonic devices and even like for my outlines, I would write like small little quips that, you know, it would trigger my brain. Like it would be like um, banana, grape, milk. And it would be because a child, you know, like slipped in a banana peel in a restaurant and then there was something with like spilled milk. It's it's dumb things like that, but they are to you. They are specific to who you are and things that will trigger your memory into like, oh, that was that case about this thing and that. And then you remember it. So, you know, all those little strategies help. Also, I recommend HNBA puts on a, a workshop exactly about this, about what is your learning style, I think, every year. Um, that's really, really um, interesting. It's the Hispanic National Bar Association. Um, and they are on LinkedIn. I suggest you follow them. They're a great organization. And if, you know, you have any questions about them, please uh, LinkedIn me or email me. Uh, I will be happy to talk to you about us. You know, learning your own learning style is super important, especially I think folks have already mentioned that it changes in law school because it's such a different method of learning and different method of taking an exam. The only thing I would add to that, which is different from that, because I 100% agree with that point, is that you should also befriend upperclassmen uh, if you're not the upperclassmen there. So if you're a 1L, befriend the 2Ls and 3Ls. Also get involved in affinity groups. There's, you know, Lausa, Balsa. Uh, most schools have a NALSA, which is for Native Americans. Um, usually they have things that are called outline banks. So all those outlines, you don't have to start from scratch. Somebody probably did really well in this class, has had from the kindness of their heart, given that to future generations, of folks involved in those affinity groups and you are now standing to benefit. So I think that plug in, getting plugged in there and getting those outlines, so you don't have to start from scratch. All you have to do is edit it from the new, you know the way that the professor is now teaching it. It's the same professor, but the new one, tweaking it and modifying it specifically to that new professor, but using that good solid uh, uh, background or that, that foundation that you have from that outline. Also, staying pretty calm because sometimes folks, especially in the more competitive classes, there's certain classes that people really like to go especially hard for, you know, to stay again, returning to my mantra of staying in your lane. People are going to be asking 50 questions in class. They're going to run up to the professor, all these things that, you know, you're going to think just, should, should I be doing that? No, do what you think is best for yourself. I was this person who I didn't understand it in class. I would just go back and try to understand it myself. Some people, you go and ask the professor, whatever your style is, do that, but don't get lost in that crit and like, you know, that shuffle of, uh, or that fight of, oh, well, this person's doing this, this person's doing that, I'm trying to get an A in like whatever this course is. No, just stay calm and, and use your resources to, to do the best that, that you can. Yeah, I agree. I would have nothing else to add. I was gonna say block out the noise, that's my tip, but I think you covered it pretty well. There was another law school related question. Um, this person asked, considering that many law schools grade on a curve, which increases the competitive nature of law school, how did you all maintain healthy social networks with your peers? 
Well, for me, it was, yes, all of us were competitive, but everyone was smart and, and, and no one, I would say it, it really depends on your school and depends also on your section. Uh, my section, everyone that graduated um, like really high, like top, like with honors was a part of my section. Um, but everyone was really nice. You could go to people, um, uh, as, as Emmanuel was saying, um, your bar affinity groups. For me, I was the president of uh, of um, the you know the LASA, um, and so making sure I kept a tight group with that. But also other lawyers in the community that I was involved. I was involved very much with HNBA even when I was a law student. Helped me out. Um, all those sort of things helped me be actually a person because the competitiveness is not just you know the actual like. Um, the, the the academic part of it but it's the mind uh psych of it it's the people saying like i i studied 27 hours a day and you're like oh my god i didn't even know i'm like is there that many hours a day no there aren't. but you know everyone is going to be saying i did this and i did that and you know everyone has their own thing if your thing is i'm going to study for a little bit and then I'm going to go to the gym and then I'm going to study again. That's your thing. You have to figure out. Law school is some of the most introspective time in your life because you will figure out really who you are as a student, what you like, how you absorb things. You know, it, it really, you can't be like envy in people because everyone works so differently. Their minds retain information in a very different manner. So, you know, whatever has worked for you. Also, if you really like a class, like, you know, keep taking it. Also, that means that you're interested. That's the, that's what I would go for. In a place like, uh, I'll speak specifically to, to Cornell Law School. Uh, I don't know how they do this, but almost every class from, so I mentioned my older brother. My older brother also went to Cornell Law School. He's three years older than me. I can say from his year, graduated in 2013. So he started uh, three years before that, 2010. From that year to when I graduated, even now, because you know I, I meet a lot of the students and I'm pretty involved still with LASA, um, also as actually coincidentally as the former president and now just kind of helping out as, a, as an alum and faculty member, really nice people. I don't know how they do it. It's a super collegial law school. People are very, very, um, you know, uh, they, they work really hard and they have a certain objective that they're trying to work. So it's not that, you know, the, the hard work, they're not hard working. They're certainly extremely hard working, but somehow, Folks here tend to be collegial. I think it has to do a lot with the, the school itself, the way the school is structured. And we've never had a problem in, in my in my uh, experience. We also have a lot of social events here. Um, there's I, every uh, month before COVID, now they started it over again. We had these things called Myron Taylor Mixers. Myron Taylor Hall is the, the name of the law school, the physical building. Every month, you know, everybody gets together. The one else, the three else faculty members, and we, you know, it's a uh, food and, and drinks, uh, and then there's the local affinity groups, sorry, the, the affinity groups at the school have events, and people are just see each other. Again, very small law school, everybody knows each other, there's not that many people, so it, it's, it's been very collegial, so I never had a problem with uh, with social, uh, like, uh, you know, uh, interactions, even across, I'd say, uh, political spectrum, right? We would be hanging out, everybody's just hanging out, and it's it, it was a lot of fun. After yeah. one, actually. The only thing I would add is um, I agree with everything that Julie and Emmanuel have said. Uh, definitely just do what's best for you and just like ignore what everyone else is doing. Just because they're doing it doesn't mean that what they're doing is right. Um, and I would say definitely turn to mentors. Finding mentors within your law school is extremely important. They've been at the law school. They know how the environment is. And having that person that you can call up or email um, and ask them, like, hey, I have the situation. How do I deal with it? How is this professor? Um, do I need to participate? Do I need to, like, go to office hours? So people that have insights into your law school and your classes could be very helpful. Um, and I definitely leaned on my mentors. Um, and they're the reason why I became involved in outside organizations like the Bar Associations, uh, Metro Law and Nelsa, because I had people that had already done that and that guided me to go into those organizations. And it's a support system of people that know what you're going through, but not necessarily within your law school, which I found great. So this next question is actually one that I hear quite often. 
Um, this person asks, do you believe that the pivot to a policy related field is easier to do with a law degree or are there better pathways? And I'm, I'm happy to take that one because I do work in, in the policy field and I have literally since law school. Um, sometimes I hear that, you know, if you don't want to be a practicing attorney, you should not go to law school. And I completely disagree with that. I think law school, despite it being a hard experience, I think it's a worthwhile experience. Um, I think it taught me critical thinking skills and made me a better writer. Like there are so many skills I got that I don't think I would have got from another graduate program. And I will say in DC, you know, the field is a little different. So I'm speaking from my perspective in DC. I feel like a lot of the time in DC for a lot of these policy jobs, people want JD, they're JD preferred jobs. In fact, there's people on the Hill all the time that want to ask me, and by the Hill, I mean people who work in Congress that are asking me, what was law school like for you? I'm thinking about going to law school because I can't really move in my office if, I, if I'm not counsel. Um, so it does really help. Um, in my day-to-day -day job, I review legislation, I write legislation, I advocate for different legislative pieces. You can probably do that. You can probably learn to do that without a law degree, but I think it would make it so much more difficult. I think that's what gives me the edge over other advocates even. Um, so certainly you don't need a law degree to go into policy, but I, I think very highly of the skills you gain from law school. Um, so I will say that, but you should do your, you, you should do your due diligence, compare programs, check out other programs and make the decision from there. But I don't think law school is a, a mistake if you're not practicing law with anything. You just have to be strategic and smart about your choices. Okay. So another question. What LSAT prep courses do you all recommend? I know that you guys need some earlier. Are there other LSAT prep tips? And then this person also asked, what tips do you recommend for tackling the bar exam? So maybe somebody can take LSAT and then the bar. I can do the bar, but I don't know who wants to speak about the LSAT. Well, for, for LSAT, I mean, the thing, though, is like the same companies that do bar prep are the same uh, companies that also do the LSAT, which are usually will be like Kaplan, um, Barbary, I think so. Um, like Prince, I know Princeton is one as well. Um, Themis, I think. Maybe I'm confusing them, but I know Princeton Review does one. Um, those are some of the like LSAT courses that you do. And I do really do recommend, you know, as, as much as you can trying to find, you know, maybe different um, organizations that may you um, may give you um, like discounts. I know what is it? It's, it's an acro it's an organization in college um, that is a Greek uh, Phi Alpha Delta. Um, it is a, a pre law um, like uh, society, uh, usually in college. Um, they're, they're actually preparing you to, to be lawyers and they, you know, they post a lot about scholarships, um, um, law school things. So I highly recommend also getting involved with them. Yeah, I would also um, just ask around, ask people who have taken certain courses and ask the bar prep companies and the LSAT companies how many people pass using their courses because that is something you should definitely know and I, actually there are a couple of companies that offer you a refund if you fail or something like that so i would just ask what comes with the course what are they offering you and how many people pass taking their courses because that's just things you need to know um and then for bar prep the tips i would recommend you have to take a course you cannot prep for the bar exam without a course similar to the lsat i think it's a little bit different because I think the bar exam is knowledge based. Obviously, you have to study a lot for it. And unlike the LSAT, it's not too much strategy. It's mostly what you know. Um, so I would say for tips, just be aware that you're going to come in no, not knowing everything. There's just not enough time for you to drill down every single topic on the bar exam. Um, and the second thing is that there's some topics in the bar exam that you should absolutely take in law school. One of them is evidence. Um, and I hear people say like, oh, you shouldn't waste your law school taking bar prep classes. I completely disagree. I feel like the classes that I took in law school for the bar exam really helped me um, 
in the sense that I didn't have to cram an entire course for the first time in a couple months. I already had a background. I knew. So during bar prep, I basically just refreshed what I already knew, which was really helpful. All right. So this, this next question was about pre-law programs. Um, people want to know what pre-law programs you all would recommend. I know that you may have already touched on this, but just naming those pre-law programs. Yes, I would suggest, again, going, uh, basically just Googling it, um, FSU, Summer for Undergraduate. Andrea mentioned uh, John's, um, pardon right. me, St. Okay. John's program. program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, St. John's having a program. Moored School of Law has a program. There are a bunch of the th there are a bunch of programs around the country that will be like pre-law that will have you like go for a summer and you'd be able to do that. But also there are programs like SEO um, that you'd be able to to look into because they specifically help you um, at very different um, uh, basically parts like pre um, pre law school and then like right. Um, they also help you, if I'm not mistaken, is uh, have a job like right before, and they could also help you is during your one um, L summer. Yeah, another one is the Sidley Scholars Program is sponsored by uh, a law firm, uh, but it's similar to the SEO program. Um, also, there's another one called Trials and another one, I believe, called Clio or mm -hmm. Leo. Um, but if you just Google them, they're all, again, pre-law programs. Yeah, I, I, you know, everybody's plugging their pre-law programs. So I'll pr plug the one I went to today as well. Same thing, but in Chicago, it was at Chicago Kent uh, College of Law called the Plus Program Pre-Law Undergraduate Summers Program. It was awesome, actually. You know, apart from actually going to class, these like mock uh, law classes, you actually meet really great people and people who potentially, at least from my experience, becomes friends, uh, become friends for life. And colleagues, some of them became lawyers, some of them didn't. They're doing really interesting. Uh, things as well. So it's really cool to, to make these uh, connections. And you never know, apart from them being friends, eventually they're going to also be resources uh, professionally as well. So it's really fun to these, do these programs. Some of them are a month long. I was a, if mine was a month long. Some of them are a little longer. Some of them are a little shorter. Um, so, you know, I think that that's a really fun program to do. But I can't stress the SEO program uh, enough. My, my wife did it. I did not do it. She went to law school after I did. And I wish I had known about it when I when I was a senior in college because that it would have potentially uh, maybe not changed my life, but it could have helped a lot significantly, especially if you're thinking about doing private big law, uh, entering that world. It makes it significantly uh, maybe not necessarily easier, but you understand that world way better than if you don't do a program like that. Oh, yeah, let me not forget Latino justice. They do law bound every year. Um, and just in general, Latino justice offers a ton of programming for pre-law students, panels, uh, conferences. Law bound is one of them. So go to their website and see what they have available because they, they offer a ton of things for people that are interested in attending law school. And I imagine a lot of these pre-law programs also fund like law school applications. Um, and also throwing it out there that AmeriCorps is another one. I did teach for America and it's an AmeriCorps program. So they paid for, they paid for all of my law school applications. I only applied for the law schools that would waive the application fee. Actually, it's a waiver, so they didn't pay for it. They would waive my application fee, which was really helpful because it could cost literally thousands of dollars to apply to law school. Um, and that's not even including the LSAT. Back in the day when I applied, I want to say each application was about $100 or so. Um, I don't know if that's changed, but programs like that really help. So definitely look at pre-law programs. But what about funding sources for your actual law school education? Are there big ones that stick out that people should check out? I would highly recommend looking at um, LCLD. It's like the Legal Council for uh, Something Diversity. Um, it, it should be in like one of the, um, it should be in the chat. Um, but LCLD, if you just Google that, you'd be able to see their 12 month of opportunities. Um, and there are scholarships and fellowships that, you know, you could apply to. Um, so I highly recommend, um, that for, you know, once you're in school. Once you're a 2L, I, I believe maybe you can't do this when you're 1L. Some of them you can do at your second semester 1L. But there's these things called diversity scholarships and they, 
uh, or law firms that give money. Some of them require you to work for them either that summer or after you graduate, depending when you apply, uh, which is great because you have a job in the bag. And that's kind of you know, <laughs> one of the purposes of going to law school, uh, one of the purposes of getting a job when you leave. But they give significant amounts of money. I'm thinking, um, I know some of them is $25,000. I've heard of one that does $50,000. It's a lot of money that, of course, mixed with the financial aid package that you get will take you a really long way towards, uh, if you do end up with uh, some student loan debt, to, towards paying that. So, and then of course, you don't need to have the debt to get these. So imagine if you get a full ride or something like that, you might not be pocketing $50,000, which is great, but pretend we're not, because that wasn't my experience. $50,000, uh, $25,000, I've seen some of them, you know, ranging between that um, is a significant amount of money. And I it's definitely suggest people, especially if you're thinking about doing big law or private practice, looking those up. They're across the country, a bunch of them in New York, LA. I think it's a few of them I've seen in Florida as well, these big law firms. All right, so last question, another big one, but I think it's also an important one. So this person wants to know, how do you deal with imposter syndrome that you might experience throughout law school or in your legal career? And I'll kick it off. Um, you know, I, I think actually to what um, AOC said, um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, um, and she really brought out the point that you can't underestimate being prepared, like just being prepared for whatever comes at you, like just professionally preparing for like that meeting or that presentation, or in my case, like really studying the bill and knowing the ins and outs. Like, I think that helps build confidence and that can also help tackle imposter syndrome. I know for me, I feel good if I know I'm prepared. Um, that makes me feel like empowered, but that's just one way to look at it. But would love to hear what our panelists think. So I agree with preparing, but also remember that sometimes you're going to fail and you're going to feel worse about it. And you're going to that that imposter syndrome is going to be, you know, making your head spin. But then realize that maybe this point in life um, is a sentence in the chapter in the, in, in the long book that is your life. And that every single experience makes us better. That's what I tell myself. And that's what I, I hope that truly is. Um, because I, I have to think that, you know, some things, some things do happen for a reason. And whether good or bad, I'm going to learn from them. Um, and really is, you are here for a purpose. You have worked this hard for everything you have, or maybe for the little that you have. But you have to be proud of yourself. You have you have come this far to even be looking at programs like these. So you have to give yourself props. Uh, you have to be able to also just you know be kinder to yourself. I feel like especially minorities, we tend to be our, our worst enemies aren't our peers, aren't you know all these other things are ourselves. We're very harsh on ourselves because we have so many expectations. So I would suggest kindness. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I always take the over preparation thing. My mentality is always, you know, if it doesn't go well, and I know it's not always going to go well, at least I gave myself a fighting chance there. So that's mm -hmm. the first thing. I totally agree with that. Now I always do that. And another thing that I always think about when I, uh, um, when those thoughts come to mind, they always creep up. Uh, no matter how long ago I, 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 I'm out of law school or even undergrad, they always creep in. It's that, you know, other people are, you know, in uh, optically in higher places than I am. And I know they did not do that well in law school, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, so your grades and all these other things are in a direct correlation. So there's people who got straight A's in law school and aren't really good attorneys, vice versa. There's people who, you know, were just coasting and, you know, they got, you know, whatever, let's say, you know, the curve at the curve or whatever. And, and maybe I shouldn't say coasting, but I'm saying that cruising, you know, they got their straight B's or whatever it is at, the, at your law school that the curve is. And they're phenomenal attorneys, partners at law firms, heads of public defenders offices. So don't sell yourself short uh, on those things. So every time those things creep into your mind, oh, I got this great in this one class. Well, I'm pretty positive a lot of really people, of people who are really, really great attorneys also got that great or worse in that same exact class. So don't don't let that uh, creep into your, into your brain. And I always remember somebody once told me that there are, you know, really important judges out here who probably were at the bottom of their classes because even the person at the bottom of their class needs to have a job when they when they leave there. So I always tell it to <laughs> remind me of myself of that. And also you could be a late bloomer. There's people who don't do well in law school and then it just all clicks when they're first year uh, or whatever the place there is or they, they, they are at. And I've seen that happen with, with friends of mine, with, with mentors who have told me that was their experience. 
we all learn at a different pace. We all kind of hit that point of, aha, a different point. So um, that's always things that I always remind myself whenever that thought creeps into my brain. Yeah, I would just say be your own cheerleader. I know it's easier said than done, but I do a lot of self-talking. Um, that's just how I manage. Uh, my grandma always says, like, look in front of the mirror and talk to yourself nice. I do it all the time, as ridiculous as it sounds, because nobody knows you better than you. So you know what you've been through. You know what you've done to get to wherever you are. Um, so you look around, just remind yourself that you got there for a reason. You deserve to be there. Um, and like Julie said, be kind to others, but also to yourself. Well, that is time. I know this conversation can cont could continue because there were so many um, gems of wisdom dropped here, but we thank you all for joining uh, joining us today for this conversation. We hope to follow up soon with some of the resources that we talked about. That way folks have something that they you know can leave with. Um, so look out for that email that could go out to the registrants. If you registered, you should be getting that. And I just wanna give a huge thank you to our panelists but also all the folks behind the scenes. Um, it was great to partner with CHCI and Latino Justice to put this event on. So thank you everyone and have a good evening. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you all. Thanks everyone, have a good night.